Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me here. And as you can see, the subject of my presentation is New Humanity of the Future and its New Barriers of Otherness in Bruce Sterling's science fiction uh, The Schismetrics. It is speculation on trans post human evolution. It, well, because it is an inter interdisciplinary conference, so we can easily shift from uh, immigrant camps and asylum seekers of yesterday to science fiction, which, which is something quite different, and speculating about the possibility of a future evolution, the evolution of humanity in terms of trans and post humanism. Well, when I uh, first came across an announcement of uh, this conference on borders slash frontiers, I was stirred by a quotation from Wendy Brown's World States Waning Sovereignty that reads, quote, what we have come to call a globalized world harbors fundamental tensions between opening and barricading, fusion and partition, erasure and reinscription, unquote. Then I said to myself that she was absolutely right in her observations about the contradictory tendencies of the contemporary world. Indeed, any, any opening action, for example, liberalization of state borders, inauguration of open source economy, or the rise of pan-globalist sentiments like pan-Americanism, pan-Europeanism, or pan-Africanism is, is countered by defensive pressures aimed to protect classical post-Westphalian state sovereignty, entrench the model of monetary economy, and fortify local nationalisms. The tendency we spot now is by no means new, though. Ever since its Darwinian evolutionary beginning, going back to the pre-hominids, humankind evolved by fits and starts to eventually emerge as the homo sapiens species divided into visually distinctive races and separated by oceanic and continental barriers. For thousands of years, humans had to cope with the frightful strangeness of the unknown others. They responded to the cognitive challenge either by conquest and subjugation of the allegedly inferior people or by erecting all kinds of great walls of stone and prejudice. The process of widening the circle of common humanity often met with resistance in the modern era, but it progressed nevertheless, reflecting the defining cultural pattern traceable to the Hebrew Bible. Of history as a sinusoidal alternation of redemptive ups and degenerate downs going on and on through time, each time requiring the people to refigure themselves. On the level of the ontological concept of mankind, the borders of humanity have been persistently pushed outward to eventually include all the human races in the 20th century. Apartheid systems of racial segregation are hopefully things of the past, and though instances of racial discrimination have not disappeared completely, they are stigmatized as shameful and barbaric. Does it mean that as a species we can finally tick off the problem of other people's ontological dissimilarity? After all, now most of us agree unanimously that we are all equally human, and thus the only crucial differences we have to handle are of social, economic, or ideological nature. This realization, if accepted, might serve as an ontological relief, but only if we assume that humanity has reached is its evolutionary zenith, a form that is essentially finite provided we ignore the limited space for improvement still possible in terms of a lifespan longer by one or two decades or a few inches increase in height. However, if human evolution is an ongoing process, then before new transposed human openings occur, we can expect a counter process of barricading humanity to defend its generic status quo. Actually, an intellectual barricade an intellectual barricade of sorts is being erected by such champions of bioconservatism as Francis Fukuyama or Leon Kass. In his book, Our Posthuman Future, in which he makes a stand against a transhuman evolution, 
Francis Fukuyama invokes the idea of human nature treated as a benchmark quality against which being or not being human can be verified. What he wants to protect is the full range of our complex evolved natures against attempts at self-modification. As he says, quote, we do not want to disrupt either the unity or the continuity of human nature, the X factor related to our very complexity and the complex interactions of uniquely human characteristics like moral choice, reason, and a broad emotional gamut. Unquote. Fukuyama is echoed by Leon Kass, who seconds him in his essay, Ageless Bodies, Happy Souls, Biotechnology, and the Pursuit of Perfection. Other bioconservatives like Bill McKibben, George Ennis, Wesley Smith, Jeremy Rifkin, or Jürgen Habermas share Fukuyama and Kass's conviction of the fixity of human nature that should not be tempered with. While bioconservatives would barricade humanity within the bastion of causal sameness and ossification, there are transposed humanist, humanist thinkers of all sorts, bioprogressives, technoprogressives, extropians, singularitarians, postgenderists, who'd rather launch our race on a trip beyond the comfort zone toward a post-human development. Anders Sandberg, one of the leading figures of transhumanism, asserts in his essay, The Transhuman Vision, that the evolution of our species has not ended, but only its character has changed. As he says, quote, we are no longer bound by biological evolution. We can choose our own path. The era of auto evolution has begun, unquote. Now, if, if we assumed that this kind of futuristic scenario is an actual possibility, then we would have to realize that technology-driven auto-evolution must ineluctably result in producing new ontological otherness. A question arises if in some medium future, humanity en masse would be ready to take such a leap. Would the coexistence of the old and progressive humans be possible? Would humanity accept the change as an evolutionary necessity, or would we be heading for a split? And if the latter were to happen, and the production of human otherness were to accelerate, would the transposed human development be enlightened and harmonious? Or would the humanity of the future be convulsed by waves of resistance? Since a transposed human future is still just a possibility, there is no evidence from experience to provide any cogent answers to the que queries. However, while speculating, about the future could be a hindrance to factual realists, it has never been a bar to science fiction writers. And regarding the issue in question, Bruce Sterling is the author of choice, for he is one of the earliest and most prominent transhuman fiction writers. The mechanist slash shaper universe Sterling created in his novel Schismetrics is well advanced on its way to reinventing humanity through technology. Within the novel's futuristic time frame, the primeval division line between accepted human sameness and rejected otherness is drawn between planet Earth and the solar system colonized by the descendants of the first space explorers. For centuries, Earth has been placed under the most rigorous interdict that was promulgated and observed by both parties. The reason for the mutual schism, sick the title Schismatrix, was the irreconcilable attitudes to technology. It is not that the people of Earth were op opposed to technology as such. After all, the whole history of mankind has been linked to the use of tools. The cause of the split between the conservative Earth and the progressive space branch of humanity was the fact that technology started to pose a danger to Earth's safety. Though the point of contention is only mentioned in passing, the conflict can be reconstructed applying Jean-Michel Besnier's train of thoughts presented in his essay, Will New Technologies Reinvent Humanity? Making an educated guess based on present day concern with uncontrolled progress that might be rushing our civilization toward a disaster we can infer that rampant technology on pre-interdict Earth 
must have endangered humanity's, quote, process of co-evolution with an environment, environment that it modifies constantly and that modifies it constantly, unquote. Technology is expected to change things, but it should not change them fundamentally. Otherwise, Besnier asks, quote, how does the perspective that humanity is reinvented by this technology seem to us to alter what we have held as obvious until now, unquote. And if technology begins to interfere with our very sense of being human, then it acquires characteristics that overturn the anthropological arrangement that it guaranteed. Such was the situation of Sterling's Earth when it was critically affected by technology-induced technology ecological meltdown. Pressed by the crisis, Earth's governments chose to stick to a stable human identity, rejecting the abomination of technology that was transforming humans into their no longer human antithesis. In confirmation of the validity of the above conjecture, Abelard Lindsay, the main protagonist of the novel, can be cited as he says, quote, the Terrans wanted stability. That's why they set up, set up the interdict. They didn't want technology to break them into pieces as it's done to us. They blamed the technology for the disasters, unquote. While the barrier of the interdict means a stop to human evolution on Earth, it is a veritable springboard for an ongoing process of post-human transformations over the space colonizing brand of mankind. The seeds of new transhumanist race of people first establish their concatenation, the ten pioneer circumlunar artificial worlds, only later to move on to the asteroid belt and the rings of Saturn rich in ice. No longer meeting resistance from conservative circles on Earth, the spacefarers should supposedly be entering an era of free, unrestrained technological development in which any progressive option should be equally welcome. This is not the case, though, for apparently neither contemporary nor speculative post-human societies can establish their subjectivity without identifying their opposite other. It does not take long for the latter to break into two major factions. Entrenched in the bastions of fiercely protected sameness while treating the others as deadly enemies. The cybernetic mechanists are techno progressives who augment the human form merging flesh with machine technology and fight the curse of aging with advanced prosthetics including eventual mind uploading. The shapers are bioprogressives who have chosen the path of artificial evolution which is effectuated through genetic engineering. The generic divide is widened by divergent habitat requirements. For the mechanists live in living complexes whose environment includes natural bacterial fauna while the shapers live in absolutely sterile conditions since their body tissues are quite aseptic. Additionally, the two branches of posthumanity have parted in terms of the manners of reproduction. The former do not deviate from traditional natural ways of conceiving children by sexual intercourse or if need be by uh, artificial insemination. The latter treat reproduction as a way of investment in new and better gene lines, which means that conception cannot be a matter of chance. Thus, shaper children are gen ge genetically designed or cloned and incubated in artificial wombs. Consequently, sexual drives are permanently suppressed as no longer existentially important, which anticipates the transhumanist idea of post-genderism that foresees the elimination of involuntary biological and psychological gendering in the human species through the application of neurotechnology, biotechnology, and reproductive technologies. A mutual inability to accept the, the equal rights of the other side to pursue its chosen mode of self-evolution leads to a war that results in the stalemate of a prolonged siege of the certain 
Saturn orbiting Schaefer ring council by the mechanists. As so frequently in human history, the futuristic intrasolar world Sterling created perpetuates the same pattern of social behavior that consists in raising walls of hatred toward of a racial and cultural other. Curiously enough, the warring parties move toward a detente period, being reconciled by sudden first contact with deep space reptilian aliens. <clears throat> the aliens' compelling and irresistible otherness serves as a catalyst that re-establishes a degree of sameness among the representatives of the divergent tracks of post-human evolution. While neither of them gives up their philosophy of life, they are able to coexist. And even though they repeatedly go through the spasms of hostility for decades on end, they feed on each other, defecting to each other's camps, and eventually taking advantage of each other's technological advancements. The mode of handling differences in a post-human universe is an extrapolation of the practices of cultural adaptation long known to humanity. Since the rise of man, human societies have been developing by reiterating two opposing tendencies. Quote, a tendency toward sameness and a tendency toward change. Wholeness versus breakdown of that wholeness. Integration versus differentiation, unquote. Ideally, the opposites tended toward an equilibrium, but any temporarily reached state of balance always contained a vector of change. As Hans Moll remarks, too much change, that is otherness, may mean disintegration, but too much sameness means loss of adaptability, which is deadly for the species' prospective evolutionary future. For the balancing of the opposites, to be fruitful, then, a Hegelian dialectic reconciliation of the conflicting ideas needs to be worked out, in the same way as chemical structure and chemical reaction form a new equilibrium, or heredity and mutation form a new variation. The post-human evolution that Sterling conjectures in schismatrics proceeds along the same dialectic pattern of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Beginning with a historic parting from Earth, progressing uh, through the phase of colonization of the solar system, and finally embracing the bold plans of an advance into the galactic arm. At each stage, progress meets with resistance. Barriers are erected, but eventually they always give in to change. And as the narrator says at the end of the novel, quote, the history of schismatrics was one long wrecking chronicle of change. New shaper ideologues embraced the aggressive schemes of visionary galacticism. The initial shock of the discovery of the 19 known races of aliens wanes. Now the galacticist prophets stood ready to abandon humanity entirely to achieve a galactic consciousness where mere loyalty to species was obsolete. For a short time, a bitter rivalry between the mechanist and shape of factions was renewed, but it abated soon. As the narrator continues, quote, history's kaleidoscope worked its permutations, its pace ever faster, approaching some unknown crescendo. Patterns changed and warped and flew apart, unquote. The new evolution is obsessed with life in all possible forms and, and is on its way to rise to the fourth prigogenic level of complexity, that of the post-human. Driven by a sense of competition, the reductionist conservatism collapses into its opposites, a progressive opposite. In a dialectic way, the otherness of post-humanity is assimilated to become a part of overall acceptable sameness. As the narrator comments, quote, the breakaway factions were much more bizarre than ever before, but people had grown used to this and their horror had lessened. Frankly, anti-human clades like the spectral intelligence, the lobsters and the blood brothers were somehow incorporated into the repertoire of possibility and even made into jokes, unquote. 
The universe that Sterling depicts is overwhelmed with a passion, a headlong rush to set life free from all possible constraints. The vision seems to echo Friedrich Nietzsche's idea of the will to power, also identified later by American philosopher Ayn Rand as the fundamental and ultimate choice perpetually confronting every organism, to live or to die. Nietzsche deems the will to power to be the essence of life. For him, it is the ontological dynamic of being, and primarily an ontological concept which refers to the way in which all things are in flux. And such is the philosophy, philosophy of the advocates of unrestrained human evolution in schismatrics. One, one may erect the dams to stop life, but it will overflow nevertheless. The future belongs to post-humanism, says Wellspring, one of the book's characters, not to nation states, not to factions, which by the way stand for barrier makers. It belongs to life and life moves in place. In conclusion, Sterling's schismatrics may be read as an anachronic futuristic polemics with Wendy Brown's observation about the human tendency to barricade itself against the strangeness of the others. Metonymically, a barrier symbolizes a belief in the finiteness and fixity of reality. What Sterling suggests about post-humans is that such a conviction would be a folly in the worlds of the far future as envisioned in the novel. Robert Frost's quotation from his poem, Mending Wall, would be more applicable. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, writes Frost, meaning that walls bespeak a lack of freedom. Facing the, facing the indeterminacy of freedom, some people will be raising barricades, but their attempts will be always in vain, Sterling suggests. There is no escaping the challenge of progressive otherness, for it is, it is part of ourselves. This knowledge is all too obvious to Abelard Lindsay, the 200-year-old protagonist of the novel, but it is not equally obvious to us, earthbound humans, which is presented as lamentable. And Lindsay does grieve over the old human prejudice. Quote, tears came to him, he wept quietly, holding nothing back. He mourned mankind and the blindness of men who thought that the cosmos had rules and limits that would shelter them from their own freedom. There were no shelters. There were no final purposes. Futility and freedom were absolute, unquote. As so many times before in its history, humanity seems to be facing the choice between growing stagnant and undergoing the de degradation or taking the risk of, a, of an evolutionary pregogenic leap to a new higher level of complexity. In his post-human vision of the schismatrics, Bruce Sterling leaves no doubt that he subscribes to the letter. Thank you for your attention.